one of the things that started to come up on the low carb, uh, certainly with keto and definitely with carnivore, was blood glucose management being really well managed. And many people got continual blood glucose monitors. You know, they started to look really good. They didn't have any clinical presentation of diabetes, no thirst, no uh, excessive urination. And then when we were getting the test back, occasionally their HbA1c would be a little bit high. And they'd say, well, well, this continual blood glucose monitor is showing me that my average range it is great. But if you, if you think it isn't that great, you could use a finger prick, which is actual blood and actual glucose. And you could check to see if your monitor is faulty, if you're worried about that. And the more this happened, the more I realized it wasn't the fact that a continual blood glucose monitor isn't directly measuring blood glucose because the finger stick definitely does. And um, it worked out that the HbA1c was not really telling us what we wanted to, to know because we'd then say, right, do the full blood test, do the fasting insulin, fasting glucose, C-peptide. Obviously, you've got your daily readings. So we know your daily readings are not spiking, dropping. There's no sort of diabetic thing. But officially, I suppose you're either pre-diabetic or diabetic, but you have no clinical presentation and you have nothing to back that up. So if you're doing a differential diagnosis, you would say, well, this is a bit of a head scratcher. Now, just by accident, I had somebody come in who was hemolytic anemic, all right, which is your red blood cells don't last as long as 120 days. And in your training, you're told to ignore the HbA1c because the red blood cells are not kicking around long enough to give you a true measure of average glycation. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist or Sherlock Holmes to think, right, so if red blood cells not lasting long enough gives you an artificially low HbA1c, and you're quite allowed to say that with those other tests, obviously, surely if it's high, higher than it seems like it should be, then maybe they're lasting longer. So then I started to get people to do a reticular site count. Reticular just, just means like, well, basically that's a baby red blood cell and it comes from the bone marrow. And lo and behold, that's what's happening. Now, both those influencers, one who is uh, firmly a vegan and the other one is pretty low carb, I think, just think that the life of a red blood cell theory is BS. And uh, I know you've called them both out that that isn't the case. And you have to look at context. And that's been a thing of, for the last five years, basically. I've been saying about all blood tests, not just that particular one. It's all about context. And you've got to, got to stop saying things like, it should be this. I'd like to see it this number. Because in your video, which I thought was excellent, you were doing what I was screaming out. Well, why? Where, where, where are you getting this perfect number from? And also, what cohort? And that's the other big thing. You see, if I have someone that's high carb, this doesn't happen for a start because they fit the normative ranges because the normative ranges are based around a high carb sort of cohort. That's, that's basically the population. So we eat differently. We have a different response. So I never really actually look at bloods now and think, well, that's a bit out of range. I always think, why would that be? And I think there is a, quite a groundswell with like LDL cholesterol, which isn't cholesterol as we know, but you know, that really, that's what everyone says, LDL uh, cholesterol. Is it high? Well, that's, that's the pejorative term, isn't it? High makes you think, oh, that's not good. But actually, is it normal? Is that what it should be? I was, yeah, I was just going to say, it, it, it always fascinates me. And you've hit a number of nails right on the head there with these bloods. As I would expect you to do, of course, Stephen, being um, being of your ilk, really. And the the thing that people don't seem to understand is that the whole testing regime itself becomes basically victim to the begging the question informal fallacy. In that, it assumes your lifestyle, behaviours, nutritionally, exercise wise, and everything else are in line with. Joe Public or Josephine Public, and then tests you under that assumption. And, you know, you fall into a range with an X number of standard deviations of the mean value for said population. Nobody bats an eyelid, even if there is clear pathology. If you're outside that range, 
then that triggers the paint by numbers, feet in the outlines, hands on the wall behavior of medics, especially in countries where, you know, medics can be struck off for thinking for themselves and things like that. And then they'll say, well, this is abnormal. This is abnormal, they will say. And ergo, we must intervene is the sort of, again, the begging the question, the next logical fallacy. Why must you intervene even if it is abnormal? Well, because yes. if there's no risk of disease, they say. And it, well, great. Show me the evidence of risk of disease because risk is a cause and effect statement requiring a mechanism. Is there one of those that's not speculative? Is there one of those that's been established with an experiment on human beings over multiple decades locked in laboratories? I wonder. Has that, has that happened? Never. So, so it's the same old speech every time. The other thing that's really interesting on the A1C is, again, with the begging the question, it assumes that your blood uh, glucose is going to go like that during the day. And... Any one given reading could be at a high point, could be at a low point. That's why we say, well, let's let's track you over time using the A1C test, which gives us a mean value. And then they say, okay, right, if your A1C is over 6.4 in many countries, you are a diabetic, okay? The damage that would be done to a person by the kind of blood spiking and troughing that would be required to produce an average blood glucose of 6.4 makes that number seem to be an appropriate number to apply to everybody. However, as we said before with the begging the question, carnivores don't spike their glucose up and down, up and down multiple times a day. It's stable, really stable. There's no evidence whatsoever that damage is being done because of that level. So even if, even if the carnivore person's A1C drifts up over six, there's no evidence that that's problematic. Because there are no spikes, which are required for the six point whatever to be problematic for someone who is doing that with it. You get what I'm yes, it's, yeah, I hope that makes sense. It uh, does make sense. Yeah. So that's, I've got a that's graphic the somewhere of someone's continual blood glucose monitor. I, I can't get it to hand straight away. But yes, you're right. I mean, it literally just shows spike, which is very pronounced. It literally is a spike. Yeah. And then a, then a trough, then a spike, and then. Literally three days into low carb, it was it was flat. 